junction and the turnoff at Norris Arm. A driver was heading east in a pickup that was towing a trailer and he lost control. Police say the vehicle traveled across the oncoming lane of highway and into a ditch. The driver, a 59-year-old man, died. Two other people in the vehicle were treated in hospital and released. Well, Newfoundland and Labrador's health minister says issues at IOC and Labrador are connected to a string of recent suicides. Five people have died by suicide in the last eight months in western Labrador. Minister Haggy says most of them were employees with IOC. The minister says extra mental health support is on the way to that region to help. The last three uh, of the five were young people who, uh, not surprisingly, worked at IOC. And whether that's a connection or not uh, is, is open to question. Uh, certainly from the point of view of uh, uh, the current issue, uh, situation, we really need to stabilise it uh, and make sure that adequate resources are on the ground to deal with uh, um, uh, any other issues that might arise in Labrador where a shipping company based out of this province is being accused of giving jobs to foreign workers instead of local people. The International Seafarers Union says Coastal Shipping Limited has reflagged at least one tanker in the Marshall Islands for work outside Canada during the winter and that means foreign sailors will be doing work that usually goes to Canadians. The union says it could result in from 60 to 100 seafarers being laid off. But the company is suggesting that number may be much lower. The union says the company is using a flag of convenience that may have consequences when the sh ship returns to work in the Canadian North. Why? Why can't they keep the Canadian crews? We're good at what we're doing. We know the ships, we know the business, we know companies are always asking us to provide crew members with, uh, with the most experience. Now they're changing the flag, they get a brand new old crew that have no idea how to, how to sail those vessels. That's okay, because it's cheap. It's slavery, that's what it is. Now the union says up to four vessels could be re-flagged, but Coastal Shipping says it's more likely only two boats. The Woodward Group of Companies also says the fleet sits in Lewisport through the winter with no work being offered to people. A tribunal has delayed its decision on whether a doctor who practiced in Labrador is guilty of professional misconduct. The Tribunal of the College of Physicians and Surgeons says it needs more time to make a decision regarding Francis Ariabo. The tribunal was expected to issue a decision today. The complaint against Ariagbo was that he had a sexual relationship with a 19-year-old woman who was his patient. Well, we are uh, bringing in uh, Ryan right now, uh, and I should remind you before we break away to Ryan and then our forum, you can get more news on our website, that's cbc.ca slash nl. And as you can see, Ryan is here, so uh, let's have a quick look at the weather, Ryan. Yeah, just a quick one, but I uh, want to update everybody. Of course, we've had the wet snow, the flurries, and that will continue through tonight uh, from the Avalon and the metro region. In fact, right up the northeast coast and into central. Again, it's inland higher elevation areas that have the best chance of picking up some accumulation tonight. Upwards of two to five centimeters, certainly possible. We're going to be seeing some lingering flurries uh, in the east and northeast with the gradual clearing through the day on Friday. Sunshine for pretty much everyone else, uh, but you can see temperatures right across the board a little on the chilly side. Saturday, certainly the pick of the weekend, a bright but brisk day right across the province. High pressure dominating a good one to get out and enjoy. Sunday, not so much. We have our next system rolling in from the south. Bit of snow possible on the leading edge of this one. Then it's over to some periods of rain at times. Heavy winds gusting 70 to 90 kilometers per hour, even stronger in the wreck house area. The good news is the latest runs have been holding the rain off in St. John's until mid afternoon, which would keep the Santa Claus parade, which starts at noon, windy but dry. Again, still a couple of days out, Debbie. Three to six hours is going to make a big difference on that forecast, so we'll keep our fingers keep, crossed. Keep and them crossed. <laughs> keep you uh, posted over the next few days. Thanks very much, Ryan. Well, it is time now to turn our attention to an issue that affects everyone on the roads. Dangerous driving. All week, we've brought you our Driven series, highlighting people who text behind the wheel, people who don't wear seat belts, and we looked at the real meaning of non-life-threatening injuries.
a vehicle was traveling south in the northbound lane. He told us there had been an accident and he wanted to take him to the hospital. No one ever thinks that this is going to happen to you. There's certain images that I will never be able to forget. When I walked into the ICU, I couldn't recognize him. Seatbelt saved me. I was now paralyzed in a wheelchair for life. You gotta remember when you're behind the wheel of that car, you're expected to behave as an adult. If you hit somebody and you're texting, it's not an accident. If you're drinking and driving, it's not an accident. You just made a conscious decision to do that. I don't even think words can express how hard to have to go and tell somebody that someone is dead. He died alone. That's what I find the most difficult. Our lives were changed in an instant. My life is totally changed because of a car accident. Your family's not whole anymore. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan Crow. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Welcome to a special edition of Here and Now. Tonight, we're tackling the issues of distracted and dangerous driving in a live public forum, and this is the reason why we're here. This particular vehicle ended up wrapped around a telephone pole. Now, too many vehicles end up this way. And while this chunk of mangled steel and plastic is disturbing, the real impact, well, it's all around us in the studio tonight. It's what's felt by all of us, the people whose lives are changed forever by injury and family and loved ones who are left behind to deal with their grief. In our studio audience, people at the front lines who deal with dangerous driving every day and families torn apart by a preventable crash, we'll hear from all of them during our program. Now, if you're watching on CBC Television, Here and Now is its regular 60 Minutes tonight. But we're going without commercials in order to maximize our time on this topic. And if you're watching us live on cbc.ca slash nl, on CBC NL's Facebook page, or on our YouTube channel, we're going an extra half an hour until 7.30 island time. Now, this is where all of you at home come in. We want to get you in on this conversation through social media, and that's where our Zach Gowdy comes in. Zach? Yes, Jonathan, we've had lots of comments on our coverage so far this week, which we certainly appreciate. We want the conversation to continue tonight. It's your chance to have your comments heard on the air or to ask questions of people participating in our forum. If you are uh, watching us on Facebook, simply type into the comments field of our live broadcast. And on Twitter, simply send us a tweet using the hashtag CBC. Driven. You can also catch up on our week of coverage on our YouTube channel. That's on youtube.com slash cbcnl. So where should tonight's conversation begin? Well, I asked both of our provincial police forces, the RCMP and the RNC, to give us some recent statistics on car crashes in Newfoundland and Labrador. Here's what we came up with. So far in 2016, there have been 8,772 collisions in this province. That sounds like a big number to me. To put it into perspective, that's roughly one person in a collision for every 50 people in Newfoundland and Labrador. And again, that's this year alone. Now, how serious are these collisions? Well, there have been 1,633 collisions resulting in a non-fatal injury. But as we heard on the program last night, non-fatal injury can mean anything from a sprained wrist to a debilitating brain injury. Lastly, when we're talking about fatality so far, there have been 36 traffic-related fatalities in the province, and that includes the gentleman who was killed yesterday. I can tell you that in 2015, last year, there were 47 people killed in our province. We seem to be doing a little better. That will be cold comfort to the family of that 59-year-old man. But many of us don't need statistics to know that there is a lot of dangerous driving happening on our roads, and boy, did we get a dramatic example of that this week. We have video here that came to us from Michael Newhook of Mount Pearl. Here he is driving down the Conception Bay South Bypass Road. I know you saw this video, folks, but we have to see it again. Now, since that video went viral, I cannot tell you how many people have come to me saying, I have my own version of that experience. If only I had a dash cam, I could have captured something similar time and time again. I know there's one gentleman who's uh, heard those stories over and over. Rudy Singleton is standing by with John. Thank you very much, Zach. And uh, thanks, Zach. And Rudy, your uh, driving instructor is 
APNL. You saw that very thing over and over again. Um, what goes through your mind when you see that? Horror. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the uh, the person who in whose vehicle the, the camera was, he certainly uh, took evasive action. And but as he said, another couple of inches, if he had hit if he had hit that soft shoulder, um, things might have worked out totally differently and tragically. I might add. Now we're calling this a forum on distracted and dangerous driving. Okay. You. We, we call this Rudy's Close Calls. We're going to do a little show and tell here. Rudy, uh, tell us about some of this tape that you brought in. Well, we have a, we have a dash cams in all our safety and our driving cars. You see, this was at uh, uh, Pearson Street and Torbay Road. Look, Black Marsh and Columbus Drive. I had the arrow. These two guys came through. Robotic driving, just no attention at all to, uh, to what's going on, no obeying the uh, signals. And this one here, look, this is a real close call in Rollins Cross. Look, green light, I'm coming through, and here's the pickup. Bang. Bang. Yeah. So, I mean, you talk about close calls. What's the guy coming up the street here? Look, I mean, the stop sign didn't exist for him. So if you're not vigilant and, and, and taking that extra look, you know, when I was, uh, or this one here, where the people cut on the, on the wrong side of the vehicle, look, I mean, that, that's incredible. If, you know, and pictures don't lie. If I didn't see it, you'd think, oh, my God, he must have staged that one. But I just see things like that way, way too often. And you know what? One of these people, I spoke to him, Jonathan, after I said, I said, you know, you went through the red light. And he said, yes. And he said, my mind was a thousand miles away. And in the research I've done about distracted driving and near misses, that there's one of the major causes of distraction are life. Mm -hmm. People are just not in the... They're not in the car, you know, in, as they should be. They're there, but they, their mind is not on the primary task. And it's a dangerous operation. These are everyday occurrences. Uh, what are the consequences if one person's doing this and they meet somebody else who's distracted by something else? Well, if I, I mean, in the first one I show there, a Pearson, uh, where it was raining, if I hadn't, I had the green light, but if I hadn't done what I always do, took that look over my right shoulder... He was coming pretty fast, and I had to drive, turn into the no drive lane, so that, that would have been a, a, a calamity and, and certainly a potential uh, fatality with the speed he was traveling and the type of vehicle I was driving. And that's why we use videos like this as teaching tools for our students to show them that this is the world they live in right around their neighborhood, and, and it's real. Uh, some of them say, my God, where'd you get that? I say, up the street from my house. Well, Rudy Singleton, I know you got a lot to say, and we're going to get back to you a little later uh, in the program. But next, Debbie, uh, you've got something for us, too. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Well, we have seen a lot of video. I want to turn our attention now to the emotional toll that some of this carnage takes on people involved and their families. 17-year-old Alyssa Davis was killed on Peacekeeper's Way just two days before Christmas last year. Uh, it's been extremely difficult on her family, and as they look forward, uh, not happily, of course, to this anniversary coming up just before Christmas, uh, it, it is difficult. Now, I spoke with Alyssa's uncle, Corey Kavanaugh. He is the public face for the family, and this is what he told me just a couple of days ago. It must be extremely difficult. Can you put that into words, how your sister and everybody else is coping at this time? It's, it's difficult to put into words, to be honest with you, because um, I don't think it's fully resonated yet. We're, we're just preparing for what we know is coming. Um, the memories, uh, the loneliness without Alyssa being here. Well, somebody else who's going to be missing a young woman, her mother, the mother of Hannah Thorne, who was killed only this past July, and that happened on the New Pond, uh, New Harbor Barrens. Uh, Gail Thorne is joining us now, and I want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Delighted to be part of it. I understand this is the first time you have spoken publicly about your daughter's death. Why is it important for you to be here and talk with me? Well, Hannah was my daughter. I have to speak for her. Mm -hmm. It was too emotional other times to talk, but I think, I'm <laughs> I think it's time for me to uh, speak out. How are you coping? We're doing it day by day. We're hanging in. That's about all I can say. We definitely have our moments. Mm -hmm. Can you take me back to the accident? What exactly happened? 
Well, my husband and I had left that day, it was a Thursday, to go to a friend's cabin uh, to a fishing trip. And Hannah was on her third day of her summer job at a gallery, art gallery in Carbonier. And her grandmother was picking her up from that job. On the way, they were having a great conversation, good fellowship between grandmother and granddaughter. And a car, a truck, F-150, pulled out into their lane on a double solid line at a high rate of speed and hit them head on. Passenger side of the vehicle took most of the brunt where Hannah was. I understand this, uh, that there are two people charged in this incident. That's still before the courts, isn't it? It's still before the courts and they are both charged with street racing and uh, negligent driving causing death and bodily harm, along with a, 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 leather, a lengthy highway traffic act mm. charges as well. We are going to speak a little bit more about what you and Hannah's friends and family have done uh, with a foundation. Uh, I just want to ask you though, finally, what was it like to be told about Hannah's death? It was the worst second in my life. I couldn't fully comprehend and because she was my child and I should have been there to protect her. I know I couldn't do anything to prevent it, but we were so far away when it happened. We were just outside of Clarenville, and it was the worst moment of our life and the less worst drive of my life. Well, Gail, we're going to, as I said, come back to you and talk about how you are trying to make a difference for others. And uh, But right now, we're going to go back over to Zach. Zach? Yes, Debbie, we were asking uh, the folks watching at home to please participate in tonight's discussion. And you can do that, first of all, uh, by Facebook. If you're watching our broadcast on Facebook, just type into the comments section. And as you can see, we're going to get uh, some of your comments right here into the show. Jade Knowles, uh, a person I know who was featured in a previous CBC story, says, crazy drivers around here. People need to just slow down. Too many lives are lost and lost forever. Lives changed because of this. That is from Jade Knowles. Calvin Baldwin says, how does one get away with having thousands in fines and still be on our roads? It's a good question, one we've tackled in previous stories as part of this Driven series. And from Leah Gannon Bryant, she says, drinking and driving is a huge problem here in Newfoundland. I couldn't agree more, Leah. Thank you so much for your question so far. Another from Bill Bloggs. All of these coming to us on the CBC Facebook page. Young drivers are not being taught the road rules properly. We have some young drivers here in our audience. We'll see what they think of Bill Bloggs' uh, comment uh, momentarily. Again, if you want to get in on this discussion, please join us on Facebook. Leave your comments in the comments field. You can also uh, chat with us on Twitter. Just use the hashtag CBCDriven. All right, let's bring the conversation back out to Jonathan. Thanks very much, Zach. Well, we heard from Gail Thorne. Um, we've heard some of the reaction on social media. One of the first people that you will meet in the aftermath of an accident is the woman beside me. Ashley Braun has been a paramedic with Eastern Health for the last six years. Uh, Ashley, first of all, thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Ashley, what sticks with you out of all your experiences as a paramedic over the last six years? What's, what keeps you up at night? Well, I would say mostly it's the family members. It's not the calls themselves that we go to. It's the aftermath that we have to deal with, with whether it's consoling parents who lose children or vice versa. It's it's their screams. It's their crying. It's just sticks with you. What is the is is there any one moment from your career that sticks with you that 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 you replay? Well, I have a couple that uh, well they'll never leave me, mm -hmm. unfortunately, and. I've just kind of made my peace with it and just try to get through it. Would you care to share one of them with us? Um, I believe the worst, something that sticks with me always is we were in a merge and I heard a woman whose son was brought in, he was in cardiac arrest and the doctor went out and told them that he had passed and her scream, her shrill, her, it chills me to my bones. Something I'll never forget. As a first responder, uh, you can have a very intense day. How do you leave it at work? Unfor 
I'm very fortunate that uh, when I go to work, work is work. So when I leave home, I'm very fortunate that I don't usually remember the faces of the people that I deal with. I can see them two weeks later, and I never know that we were in their home hauling them out. It's just something I'm very blessed with. Do you keep track of the people that, um, you know, that, that you basically bring to the hospital? Do you find out how they did? Uh, I try to. I try to, just to see if they made out okay or not. And if I can and I find out that they did, that's wonderful. And uh, if I can't, well, that's that. As a first responder, I want to give you the opportunity now to, I guess, give people out there your message. Uh, what's, if, you, if you have the, the, you know, the opportunity to say any one thing, what would your message be? Any one thing. I would say it's 2016. Drinking and driving is absolutely unacceptable. We should know better by now. All right. That's Ashley Braun, a paramedic with Eastern Health. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I believe we're going back over now to Zach. Zach? Yes, Jonathan. As you can see, there's a lot of people in our studio audience tonight. The idea was to bring as many people as we can with as many perspectives on this issue as we can. And uh, some voices that we absolutely had to include were people who've been victims of car accidents themselves. Now, if you've been watching our programming throughout this week, you'll know that last night we featured two people who survived car crashes and yet their lives were never the same. Now, one of those people is here in our studio tonight. Last night, you met Randy White and his mother, Marina. I'm going to go chat with them live. But first of all, let's just take a look at their story. And, uh, I'm starving. You're starving? Okay. Will you go get the muffins? There's something so traumatic and earth-shattering. You either dig your heels in and fight to stay alive or... Yeah. You just give up and walk away, which some people do do. Uh, Four door. What do you remember about the accident, Randy? Uh, C, B, and uh, caught in front of me. C belt saved me. Well, it was a Saturday night. Uh, Randy had been home. And then he said, I'm going to see some friends. So that's what he did. And at 11.30, um, we heard the ambulance go up the street. And I walked into the ICU unit, into his room, and saw him. I couldn't recognize him. He wasn't the Randy I had seen that night. Changed everything, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is exactly. Old walk, talk, speech, everything. Uh, yeah. uh, well, the doctors told us he'd never walk or talk, and he'd never know us. So, you know, this <laughs> this is good. <laughs> and I'm standing by with uh, Randy and Marina White uh, right now. First of all, guys, I just wanted to thank you for being here, and thank you so much for sharing the story uh, that you did with us. This uh, programming doesn't happen without people willing to open themselves up like you guys did, so thank you so much. No problem. Randy, how did it feel when you saw your story on television? A uh, blow me mind. Uh, walking, talking, speech, everything. Lucky I uh, broke my neck at Paralyze. You know, I've uh, had the, the privilege to speak to many people who've been in your situation, and uh, I can tell you that your, your outlook on your accident, your, your frame of mind, uh, is certainly something that I know a lot of people in, you know, would appreciate to have in their own selves. And Marina, when you spoke about that, you talked about how important it was for both of you guys to maintain positivity in the face of uh, all that you've experienced. Well, our philosophy is that you never give up. You know, you, you plug in, you get strength from everybody around you, friends, family. Um, everyone that's willing to help, you know, makes you a little stronger. Now, Marina, I know you are also, uh, and have become since Randy's accident, uh, the vice president of the Newfoundland and Labrador Brain Injury Association. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit how you've used your own experience to help people uh, who you, whom you've met uh, through, the, who've been in similar situation to Randy? Mm -hmm. Well, we have survivors within our uh, association. Uh, survivors in a group and uh, we meet and we're support for each other you know and my experience you know to 
parents that have gone through what we have gone through. You know, we just encourage them to, you have to be an advocate for yourself, if nothing else, because there's very little out there, as you know. So you have to fight, you have to do your, you know, diligence and just never give up. Now, we spoke with you guys uh, during a story about non-life-threatening injuries, how we were trying to reframe the way people think about uh, non-life-threatening injuries or mm -hmm. accident victims that are described in that way. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you, since the story aired, what have people been saying to you uh, about that subject? Well, people have said to me, you know, gee, we didn't realize that. You know, you don't realize the impact that it has on a person that has gone through a traumatic injury. And, you know, it makes people stop and wonder, well, exactly what did happen to that person? You know, were they critically injured? Yeah. Was there a change, you know, for life? I mean, there's a lot of people involved with it, you know. Randy, next time you go at the gym, I bet a lot of people are going to be recognizing you and spend it. Is exactly <laughs> um, oh, uh, a miracle. Uh, uh, look at me. Uh, true. Yeah. true so you never mm. give up. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that with us, guys. No, oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. We're going to send it back over to Debbie. Thank you very much, and thank you, Randy. What an inspiration. I'm joined here now by uh, Don Byrne, is the superintendent of the St. John's Regional Fire Department. Uh, superintendent, um, we're standing by this wreck. You've been in this uh, line of work of yours for decades now. How many of these have you seen over all that time? Hundreds. 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 Yeah. Um, the impact, uh, it's not just seeing the accident, it's the impact on the families and the victims mm -hmm. at the scene, and certainly the impact on the workers, the firefighters, the EMS workers, who attend to these victims. I wanted to ask you about that as we were, as Jonathan was talking with our paramedic earlier, the impact on the first responders like your firefighters. Um, you may be used to it as much as that's possible. Well, what do you say to the young firefighters who are starting off? Look, at the end of the day, they're going to see some very impactful uh, situations that are going to deal with human trauma. Uh, we incorporate uh, critical incident stress debriefings in all incidents such as this. Uh, we've been doing that for uh, pretty close on 25 years actually. Um, we incorporate those debriefings wherever we see this kind of trauma. So it's fairly often. Uh, you mentioned at the top of your show about the accident in Lewisport, and one of the gentlemen who facilitates uh, a lot of these debriefings for us is actually out there, or was out there last night to deal with the EMS workers who attended to that accident. That 59, the 59 year old man who lost his life. Correct, mm -hmm. yeah. I wanna ask you again about, uh, you know, we're standing next to this vehicle that hit a, a pole, um, no fatalities, fortunately. Um, do you have a sense of what's the number one cause these days for the accidents that you attend? First and foremost would be inattentive drivers. Mm -hmm. And those distractions are many, it could be music, but more often than not, it's cell phones, uh, people who are texting, utilizing their cell phones, and as has been already alluded to, certainly the impaired driver. Mm -hmm. But for the greater part is the inattentiveness. Have you seen that change over the recent years? Going back almost 40 years, uh, primary causes uh, back then were number one was impaired driver, if you look back over the years. Uh, secondly would be lack of use of, of seat belts. So we've seen those transitions and now we're into the cell phones mm -hmm. and the iPhones and the impact that they're having on the driving public. Anything you want to finally add here? Uh, more important, the most important thing is look, there's nothing so important that you need to be texting your friends about at that moment when your attention needs to be to the task at hand, which is driving. 
Don Byrne, thank you very much for uh, talking with me at this forum. And uh, let's head back over to Jonathan. Thanks very much, Tebby. And uh, let me introduce you to one man who's learning to drive and one young woman who has her license, Megan Lambert, John Harris. Uh, first of all, Megan, to you. Um, as you hear some of the stories, you see the car wreck sitting in the middle of the studio as a new driver. What are your thoughts? Um, that's definitely very scary and something that I think about all the time as I'm a new driver. Um, I can only do so much, but what's scarier is the other people on the roads and what they're going to do. And I personally don't text and drive, but I know a lot of people that do. And I just think it's silly because not only are you putting yourself at risk, but you're putting so many other people in danger. And if you can control that, then that's something that you shouldn't do. Yeah, we heard Superintendent Byrne talk about that as one of the major problems. Um, how do you avoid using your iPhone or being distracted by your iPhone while you are driving? Well, it is very tempting when you hear it going off and you're like, oh, who's texting me? Like, what's going on? Uh, so for me, what I do is I turn it off or I keep it in my purse or, you know, if I do hear my phone ringing and I have somebody in the car, then I'll get them to pick it up and text them back or call them. I want to ask you about some of those other drivers on the road that you were, that you were talking about off the top. Um, what about them? Does it make you nervous? It does, yeah, because, you know, sometimes you see people swerving in and out of different lanes of traffic, not putting on their signal light, um, which is a magical little thing that's in every single car. Uh, but, yeah, it's definitely scary because you never know. Like Rudy said, like, people can be thousand miles away and thinking about something else. And, you know, you have to be the best driver that you can be, but at the end of the day, it's kind of, uh, you know, out of your control. Do you sometimes think that young people behind the wheel get a bad reputation? I mean, is it is it justified or unjustified? What do you think? Um, I don't really know. For me personally, I think, you know, we're all painted with, oh, we all text and we all, you know, drive very fast. And for me personally, I don't, but uh, I do know a lot of people that do, so I guess it's kind of justifiable, but I'd like for it not to be. Well, a lot of people of all ages uh, have some bad habits. Megan Lambert, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, over to a young fellow who's uh, just learning to drive. How is it going so far, John? I think it's uh, <clears throat> it's going pretty good. I'm kind of learning the ways of the road and uh, kind of learning that danger is always imminent, like as Rudy says. When you talk about that imminent, imminent danger, uh, what do you mean? What are some of the, um, I guess, the experiences that stand out for you? Well, I've, I've never really considered before I did driving school, like how, how dangerous driving can be. And, and just being in the car in this big uh, kind of metal object that can be with other metal objects going at really fast speeds with unpredictable drivers it's really hard to it's really hard to kind of make sure you're safe on the road john uh some people some young people uh look at driving as a right uh i think people like rudy singleton would like you to look at it as a responsibility can you explain the difference i i think i think everybody should get the chance to drive but when you're on your road on the road, I think it's your responsibility to be safe and be the best driver you can, because a lot of people do take it as a uh, as a, a right, and they they are entitled to do whatever they want on the road. But that's just not the case. So when do you get your license? I get it in on December twentieth. I think I'm pretty excited. All right, well, good luck, and uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. All right, thanks to John Harris and Megan Lambert. Uh, Zach, let's get back over to you. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Now, I'm standing by uh, with two members of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, Superintendent Joe Boland and Sergeant uh, Paul Didham. And uh, first of all, to you, uh, Superintendent Boland, I'm not sure if everybody necessarily realizes that this was all your idea. Uh, you sort of were the, the originator of the Driven Project. Just take me back to when you had the light bulb moment uh, for all of this. Uh, I'm not sure when I had the light bulb moment. I, I wished actually that this had happened probably two years ago, this forum, because it's just fabulous that CBC took this on and did what they did with it. Um, I guess every day coming to work and reading files and talking to members in our accident investigation section and looking at the impact that it had on them. But when you read the files and when you see the people here in this audience, the impact that it has on them and, and their loved ones, it's just you keep on saying to yourself that there's more that we could be doing. And uh, so I'd, I'd sit every day almost and, and speak with Paul and say, what else is it that we can, do, we can do with this? And, of course, you know, our goal is, you know, to bring awareness, to bring education and enforcement. And so I guess after the last, one of the conversations I had with one member who actually had to leave our unit, I said, there's definitely more that we can do. And I reached out to, uh, to yourself and Peter Gulledge with CBC 
and said, I'd like to have a conversation with you about uh, highway safety. And uh, Driven was born. So. You know, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that uh, member was uh, Constable uh, Ken Milks, uh, who we have interviewed for this Driven series, and I do believe we have a clip of Constable Milks that I'll ask the control room to queue up for me. Uh, but before we go to that, I want to get a question to you, uh, Sergeant Paul Didham. Uh, you've been featured in two uh, Driven stories now, and I know that uh, we wanted to get these issues of road safety out there, but another thing that you and I talked about uh, was the effect that if we had police officers uh, on our programming interacting with people uh, in a different way than we normally see uh, on the news, that maybe people might interact with you in the public in, in a different way if they got to know you and think of you more as, as a person, as a human being. Just wondering, after a year of this series, has that happened? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's great uh, working with the CBC and, and with my uh, co-workers at work and the general public, getting to know the people that uh, we've got to meet throughout this process is great. Uh, I have people coming up to me when I'm, you know, in my own personal life and uh, speaking to me about what we're doing uh, collaboratively with, with CBC and, and the community. So, I mean, it works great. Um, we're not where we want to be, obviously, because we still have some work to do, but, uh, you know, we're certainly moving in the right direction, so let's, let's keep moving there. All right, guys, on that note, uh, unfortunately, I, I'm going to read for you uh, some breaking news that I have coming in from the control room instead. I, I asked for the clip of Ken Milks. We're going to do that now in a moment, I, but I have to get this out there first. Okay, coming to you right now, breaking news story out of Botwood. Multiple people have been brought to hospital following a two-vehicle collision. The RCMP uh, are interviewing, or investigating, I'm sorry, a collision in the community of Peterview. Two vehicles collided head-on, police say. The RCMP said there were, quote, some non-fatal injuries incurred in the crash. Maury Callahan the deputy chief of the fire, uh, the Botwood Fire Department wrote that several victims were brought to hospital. So this, again, during tonight's broadcast, we have a breaking news story of a two-vehicle collision in the community of Peterview. This is why we, we are here. Uh, just a moment ago, uh, when I was speaking with uh, Superintendent Joe Boland, who was supervising the RNC's traffic section, he brought up that one of his members uh, had to leave the, the traffic section after uh, doing well. One of the most difficult jobs in all of policing one too many times, and that is delivering the news uh, to a victim's family uh, that somebody has uh, been killed in a car crash. I spoke to Constable Ken Milks about his experiences uh, in the very first driven story last March. They are hysterical. They're breaking down. They're crying. It's, but you, you could be crying. You know, that there's hugs, there's holding, there's fear, there's telling me to get out of the place. I've taken a break um, from doing accidents because I just it got to the point where it was a little bit overwhelming. It's it's hard on your family life. It's hard because they don't understand what you're what you're feeling. The kids say like, "What's what's wrong with dad? Why is dad like? Why is dad so sad?" And that's really hard. That is Constable uh, Ken Milks. Uh, he went on from the RNC traffic section to be part of the RNC's uh, DARE program, where he now has the privilege about uh, talking to some of the, uh, to uh, young people about some of the very issues that we are talking about tonight. But I just want to ask you both real quick, uh, after seeing uh, Constable Milks's uh, interview during last winter's broadcast, I mean, being open about yourself and your feelings and vulnerable in the way that we just saw him being, it's not something we typically associate with police officers. Just wondering around the station, after Constable Milks's interview, aired. What, what was the word in your office? What did people say to him? I mean, I, I, what I've received and what I've seen, I've worked with Ken for a long time. I mean, he's uh, second to none when it comes to investigating these types of matters. Uh, very qualified, very well educated, and I mean, he's a great investigator. Um, but, you know, I, I could see uh, how he was being affected by these, dealing with these types of matters. I've gone through it myself. But, I mean, to be able to come out and speak as a human, because a lot of people don't realize that we're people as well. And uh, being able to put that human side to things uh, certainly opens a lot of eyes. Now, it's certainly nothing compared to what family members of, of victims of collisions and crisis go through. Uh, you know, one of the things that we take comfort in is being able to assist people during those times of need. But, uh, you know, it certainly is trying times for us. And, it's, I mean, when Ken came out, and, and I was a part of your, your message as well at the same time, uh, you know, we, we all run through those types of emotions, and it's uh, certainly not easy. Well, I know very few people can relate to that, uh, but standing by with Debbie are two people uh, who certainly can. So let's hear from them now. 
Thanks very much, Zach. Well, I'm going to speak with uh, Heather Dean, uh, who's with the St. John's Regional Fire Department, and you are a dispatcher. Just tell us exactly what you do, Heather. Sure. Um, I take 911 calls for the Avalon portion of the island, uh, dispatch for fire, transfer if it's police or ambulance. You're the first point of contact when something goes wrong. Um, just tell me about uh, what you, what kind of calls you're taking and and what does it take to be a dispatcher? You have to be pretty cool, I would think. I, like any emergency responder, you know, you have to be able to keep your calm and, and kind of collect yourself and make sure that the other person is calm because, you know, when you're taking calls, people are panicked, right? So it's hard to get information out of a panicked person. So, you know, we kind of have to talk them through it and get the information as, as best we can. I know this has been asked to others, uh, but is there something, one incident uh, that stands out to you and something that you might have followed up on? I get that asked a lot. Um, no, not really. There's always going to be calls, like with Ashley, you know, that will stick with me forever. Um, but you kind of compartmentalize it and put it away and you just kind of cope with it and deal with it. And so how far uh, do you dispatch uh, ambulances, fire trucks, and all that? What's the coverage area? Uh, St. John's area, the whole northeast Avalon, the, uh, right up until Goobies, basically. A long stretch of Trans-Canada Highway that has seen a lot of accidents, eh? Hey? Yes, it is. And it's sometimes hard to get you know, the information as to exactly where you are. Right. Well, thank you very much, Heather Dehan. Thanks for being here. And uh, let's go back over to Jonathan now. Thanks very much, Debbie. Well, you know, earlier we heard that very uh, poignant interview with Gail Thorne, Hannah's mom. I've got two of her friends here. Uh, first of all, you guys told me your names earlier, <laughs> and I couldn't remember them, so I'm going to do, do the old reporter's ploy. Uh, what's your name? I'm Kylie Jackson. Kylie, and what's your name? Heidi Jackson. Uh, okay. Kylie and Heidi, okay. Well, well first of all, Kylie, um, take me back to the day that you found out uh, that you'd lost Hannah. Uh, what was that day like for you? When you think of it now, it was more like a blur. It was just happened all so fast, but it seemed like the longest day of my life because just seconds before, like, Heidi was texting me, freaking out because we didn't hear from her. And then I went out and I was just kind of by myself, and then I went back in the house, and my mom told me that, like, she was gone, and it was just, I went weak. I was just in mortal shock. Then my group of friends came up, and we just all sat around. It was just one of the hardest days of my life. Why did you want to be here tonight? Because I don't want anyone else to feel like the way I'm feeling now, because no one at the age of 18 should be thinking of how to plan your best friend's funeral. Like, you shouldn't have to start off your life thinking of that. And we just need to change the way people's driving that so many other lives are not affected by it. What do people need to do? What do you think, what do you think is the most, some of the most important aspects of this for you? Um, one of the most important is that people need to slow down and realize that speed isn't that important when it comes. It's not just your life at risk. It's so, so, many, else, so many other lives. And it's, you're just not affecting that one person. You're affecting, like, in this case, the community, the family, the friends, people from all over know about Hannah's story. And it's just so many lives are affected because of it. Okay, Kali, I'm going to ask uh, Heidi a couple of questions now. Heidi... I know that we, you know, we talk a lot about statistics, right? And your friend is a name, a face, uh, a person, one of those statistics. What is it that you'd like people to remember about uh, Hannah? Um, well, actually, one of the things I told my mom after Hannah died was that I was worried that so many people would just remember her as a poor girl that died. And they wouldn't remember her for what I know her as. She was the feeling you felt when you were around her. She could make anybody happy. She could make your day. You just had to know her. She was one of a kind, and she was goofy and silly, and she is going to make a change. She may not be here, but she's going to make a change to everybody. I asked uh, Kylie the same question. Uh, why did you want to be here tonight? Um... I couldn't save Hannah that day. I waited for her to come home, and you knew what had happened. 
But by doing what we're doing with the Stan Foundation, I believe that we're going to save somebody else's Hannah. And that's our goal. And that's what I want to do here today. I want to tell people, don't go too fast. Don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. Save the person coming to you. It's somebody's daughter, somebody's son. You don't want to see what Aunt Levi have gone through. Tell me a little bit about the foundation. What's that all about? Um, the Stand for Hannah Foundation is created by Hannah's friends and family and other members. And we're trying to change drive, basically. Uh, we're trying to promote what we're doing here tonight, promote uh, safe driving, and try to get it out there that this didn't just affect us for the week that we grieved Hannah. We are always going to grieve her, just as anybody else who have lost somebody. Are you a driver yourself, Heidi? I am, yes. Has this in any way, uh, you know, I know Hannah had no control over what happened, but has this in any way uh, changed the way you look at things when you get behind the wheel? Um, definitely, and not only when I'm behind the wheel, I'm very jumpy and scared, and I wait longer at the lights when it turns green to see if anybody's coming, and I'm always very cautious of my speed now more than ever. Kylie, what about you? Are you a driver? I am a driver. And how has it affected, you know, the way you deal with driving? It affected me a lot because, again, my speed is down and you're more cautious. But my parents always told me it's not like you're not worried about me driving. It's the other people. So you are always got your eye for, like, when you're in the passing lanes or even now when you're not in the passing lane just to see if anyone's coming and if you have time to stop because that person might not have any time to stop. Going to give you the last word here. <laughs> Um, you've got you've you've got the forum here. What do you want to say to people out there? Oh God, um, I want to say that just we're here standing for Hannah. You got to think of what would you do if this was your best friend or your daughter or your son. You never know how you're going to react until you're in the situation. And my life has changed, and I don't want to see anyone else go through what we're going through. Thank you very much. Thank you both of you. Thank you. That's Heidi and Kylie Jackson. Um, Zach, back to you. Thanks so much, Jonathan. We want to bring in uh, some more comments now from people who are watching at home. Again, you can send in a comment or a question to us on Twitter. Just use the hashtag CBC Driven. And our first comment uh, comes from a gentleman on Twitter uh, with the handle McCormick's McCormex did a bunch of consonants that I cannot pronounce. But I can tell you that this gentleman is a tow truck driver. He has a very serious comment to make. Again, tow truck drivers are among the first people who respond uh, to accidents, often see some very horrific things themselves. He says to us, don't forget about the tow truck operators left to deal with these tangled wrecks terrible for us too. I've met quite a number of tow truck drivers in my career uh, covering accidents in this province. I'd also like to mention that uh, a tow truck driver told me once they often become the victims of accidents themselves uh, because they are working on the sides of the road, often the side of the highway, often at night when it's dark, difficult to see them even though they have their flashing lights. Those are emergency lights on tow trucks, yet very few people slow down for a tow truck on the side of the road the way they would slow down for a police car or a fire vehicle or an ambulance. Please keep that in mind the next time you see one. All right. Also, you can participate in this discussion on Facebook. Uh, just type into the comment field on our live broadcast a comment coming to us from Mike Kennedy. He says, I never leave a red light anymore without checking both ways. People are running red lights all the time. That comment from Mike Kennedy on Facebook. Janet Kelly Hale says, so awesome that you're doing this. Getting perspective from law enforcement, bereaved families, a driving instructor, and our young people, this needs to be shown. Thank you, Janet. We appreciate your comment. From Tasha Brazel, she says, I think the dash cams should be in all vehicles. Michael Newhook, the man behind that viral dash cam video this week, agrees with you, Tasha. And lastly, from Laura Jacqueline on Facebook, she says, I'm watching from Nova Scotia. And I think it is a big issue here, too. I see people texting and driving every day and not just young people. Thanks for making that point, Jacqueline, and uh, from watching us from a few provinces over. We appreciate it. Please keep those comments and questions coming. And again, uh, we will get to more of them after we wrap up on television. We are continuing for an extra 30 minutes on uh, Facebook and YouTube. All right, we'll send it over to Debbie. 
Thanks very much, Zach. And uh, right here now is uh, RCMP Constable Janet Austin with the Traffic Services. Thank you very much for being here. There's a lot of discussion and right in the middle of talking about distracted, dangerous driving, we hear of this head-on collision. Um, multiple injuries, we just don't, don't know the extent of it now, but what goes through your mind as a Traffic Services person when you hear this? Um, obviously there's something that went very wrong when you have two vehicles that collide head-on. We are seeing, unfortunately, an increase in the number of collisions that are caused by one vehicle crossing over the line. And we can't always find the answer for it. Um, if the people don't remember the crash or haven't survived, we can't get the answer from them themselves as to what happened in that vehicle. We, we have been showing this week the dash cam video that showed a very, very close call. Um, what do you think about um, making them part of vehicles? Is this a discussion that uh, police forces have? Um, not for, we encourage our, a lot of our cars have dash cams, obviously for our enf enforcement reasons, um, to encourage um, the retail industry to, all that is something that I think is be a little bit beyond our scope. It certainly would help us as investigators and for, for safety reasons. How worried are you these days about distracted driving? Has it increased recently? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's always been an issue in terms of it's easy to be distracted even if you're having a conversation with somebody that's in the vehicle with you. But now that the cell phones have come Kids out, in the back. Kids in the back, yes. The, the parent turning around to talk to the kids because they're not behaving. So it, it has always been an issue, but it hasn't been so prevalent as when cell phones came into use because it just seems so much more. How receptive are schools uh, and to hearing from police. I know that there are public education services. Is that something you're involved in in any way? We do that on a basis through, uh, through the detachments, yes. Mm -hmm. So the schools are usually very receptive. There's a new program that they've started up uh, on the Avalon called Tire, which is teaching basically young people how to uh, ride their ATVs responsibly because we still have deaths and injuries on those uh, machines as well. And we heard uh, from some young people here talking about how they are alert now to the dangers because of the training and, uh, unfortunately, the loss of a very close friend. It is tough, though, to get the message through to people to drive responsibly, isn't it? It's very tough because most people, once they're in their vehicle, uh, tend to be in their own little world and they just need to go where they're going and that's what's on their mind. Constable, uh, Constable Janet Austin, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's uh, head back over to Jonathan. Hey, thanks, Debbie. Well, we've had a chance to uh, hear from some of the people in the room, some friends of Hannah Thorne's. Um, I want to chat with Gail Thorne again for just a couple of seconds. As you hear what these two young ladies had to say, what went through your mind? It's tough to listen to them. It really is. I admire their strength. Both of them have uh, spoken at a, d a couple of different presentations when I could not speak. I don't know where they mustered the strength, but they did. It's awesome to have them here, and I love them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what does it mean to have them here? They're speaking for Hannah, yeah. just as we are, too. Again, as Kylie and Heidi both said, at the age of 18, they shouldn't be planning their best friend's funeral. They should have been planning. They had an apartment. They were ready to come into post-secondary in September. They should have been planning their life, not their best friend's funeral. I know, uh, you know, I've, I've heard you never get over something like this. You just deal with it. I mean, how does having Hannah's friends around uh, on a daily or weekly basis help you? Absolutely. It does get me through that. I talk to them all the time. I text them. They call me. They come to the house. It's part of Hannah, the both of them. It's, it's part of Hannah, and I just love to have them come. <laughs> it's hard to see them. It's hard when they go, but they're definitely part of Hannah. All right, Gail, thanks. Um, I'm just going to move over here to, uh, to Dwayne Legg. And uh, Dwayne, first of all, I'm just going to shuffle over here. Sorry, Randy. Um, I just want to, I, I guess, Dwayne, first of all, what's your uh, relationship to Hannah and Gail? Uh, I'm a relative, um, and I'm also one of the members who organized the Stand for Hannah Foundation. Why was it important to organize the foundation for you? Well, for me, it actually, um, I would say it was from 
uh, Gail and Levi's will and determination that we needed to make sure that there was something positive came from this tragedy. We couldn't have um, Hannah's death happen in vain. So we really, we have a group of people who are committed to the cause. Um, our goals are to bring awareness of the real impacts, the human impacts of dangerous driving and negligent driving, but also uh, make a concerted effort to try to change legislation and policy in this province. When you talk about legislation and policy, what specifically would you be looking for from the government? Well, we, we've actually had some very positive discussions with government, and uh, I will say that the Department of Justice, Service NL, and the Department of Health and Community Services have indicated they are on our side and want to work with us to make changes, but specifically we're looking for amendments with the Highway Traffic Act. Um, for instance, where in, there were, are instances where negligence is at play, evidence shows that, that a driver's license would be suspended pending further investigation. Um, we're also looking at issues around the Fatalities Investigation Act um, and looking to make some changes there so that the families of those who um, unfortunately have a deceased involved in an incident, that they are treated fairly and have all the supports that they need. Just give me a quick idea of some of the events that you have coming up. Well, we've, uh, we've been very um, fortunate in that we've had a lot of people reaching out to us. We've uh, just recently spoke at the National Day of Remembrance for Road Crash Victims. We have engagements coming up with driving schools to get in and talk with them. We, one of our major things that we want to do is to uh, produce a video that can be used throughout the province, whether that be in driving schools. Uh, we want to get out into the schools and we've seen some support on that. So we're currently in the phase of trying to raise money to try to develop that because we feel that these real stories, the, as such as speaking with Heidi and, and Kylie, that's what's really going to make an impact, what people can relate to. Statistics are great, we all need to know them, but it needs to be that human face that people can see really what their decisions can, the consequence, consequences they can have. A few minutes ago, Zach told us about something that happened while we were on the air, a bad collision in the Botwood area. Um, what went through your mind when you heard that? Well, immediately, given the circumstance that we're in, it, it went to the families. What are they going through now? There's a lot of unknowns when that happens initially. You don't know. People are trying to scramble to find out exactly what happens. Sometimes there's, there's conflicting uh, reports on what's happening. What we've learned through this is that the law enforcement and the first responders, they have a job to do and they have things that they need to deal with. And sometimes everybody's trying to get through that and make sure that they handle it properly. Um, so we just want to make sure that, you know, that's handled properly. People get the supports they need, understanding that these groups are working together. But yeah, as soon as I heard that, it was like, what's the family going through now? Dwayne Legg and Gail Thorne, thanks so much. Uh, it's great work that you're doing. Um, over to you, Zach. Thanks, John. I'm standing by with Brianna Mercer, another member of the Stand for Hannah Foundation. Uh, Brianna, we've just got about a minute left here on our TV broadcast, but I wanted to ask you, what do you make of the comments and the conversation that you've been hearing in the room tonight? Um, I think we're all on the same page. We just need people to slow down. We need people to take a look at their surroundings, think about what you do. There are so many people here that are grieving. Like, I didn't even have the personal experience with Hannah, but I am a community member. I have a sister, I have a cousin, I have a godchild. We are all affected by this. You have to think while you are driving. You cannot just be texting. You cannot just be singing, singing to your music and changing the channel. You have to think. I know you guys uh, do some big projects. We just talked about a video that you're hoping to produce, but I know also that that change in society that sometimes happens incrementally with just little conversations that people like yourself have with other people in your life, right? Yes. When you have that personal connection, and we all have personal connections, you, you don't just know yourself. So just, just think of the people around you. Think of what they will have to deal with. That's right. Well, listen, Brianna, I really appreciate uh, you speaking with me, and thanks for being part of tonight. Thank you very much. I will send it back over to John and Deb to wrap up our TV broadcast. That's right, Zach. We are going to say goodnight to our viewers watching us on CBC Television. This important conversation is going to continue, though, online. Join us live on cbc.ca slash nl. And, of course, Debbie, we're also on Facebook and Twitter at CBCNL. You can be part of the conversation. Just use the hashtag CBCDriven.
And uh, welcome uh, back for those of you who have been on a line on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. We are continuing for the next half hour. Our television viewers on Here and Now, of course, have uh, left us for now. They'll be back tomorrow night for Here and Now, of course, Jonathan. Yeah, this is a great luxury. We've got half an hour of extra air time, and we plan to dig a little deeper into this issue of distracted and dangerous driving. All right, I guess we're going to send it over to Zach. Zach. Thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. And again, it is a real privilege for us to be able to continue this conversation. Um, the main thing that we wanted to do, again, was to have a conversation with the people in the room, a lot of different perspectives, and with you at home. And we want that to continue. Uh, please, if you have something to say on this topic, you can uh, leave a comment in the Facebook comment section on the live broadcast of this video. And uh, you can also come to us uh, on Twitter at hashtag CBC Driven. Okay, now we did get uh, quite a lot of information together before this program. Some of it is uh, national statistics. And uh, I did put together a short animation that talks about distracted driving. It's been a big part of tonight's conversation. So let's take a look at uh, distracted driving and the consequences of checking your phone when you're behind the wheel. You are driving on a road in a residential area during the winter. It's a nice day, so you're going the speed limit at 50 kilometers per hour. Your best friend texts you. You want to reply right away. Research tells us it takes 34 seconds to respond to a text, which means you've traveled half a kilometer before you look at the road again. That's the equivalent of passing 85 parked cars or driving through five city intersections. Thank you so much. Uh, again, the conversation continues now online. I've been asking people to send us comments using hashtag CBC driven. We have more of those comments coming into us right now. Uh, this one from the RNC, heavily represented tonight and a big part of the series right from day one. Uh, from the RNC Twitter account, we appreciate the valuable work of the tow operators and recognize the effect these horrific car wrecks have on you as well. Uh, just a moment ago, we had a tweet from a person who drives a tow truck to say that they too, uh, as first responders in some of these accident scenes, often deal with the trauma of the things that they see. From Michelle Hall, frequent presence on Twitter, she says, every single time I'm stopped at a traffic light, I see people running red lights. Every single time. Michelle, I know many of us have that same experience. From Zach Parrell, also on Twitter, he says, just witnessed a car blow a red light in an intersection full of first responders from a previous motor vehicle collision. Seriously? Yeah, I know a lot of us also feel the same way, Zach. From D. Voisey on Twitter, she says, sometimes we get overly confident and more distracted with experience. A collision smartened me up. That's something I've heard uh, many times. People often complain about young drivers. The flip side of that, of course, is young drivers are uh, sometimes, because they've just recently been trained, have those rules of the road fresh in their mind. We uh, broke this story earlier for you folks. Uh, again, it's the kind of thing that you just can't plan for, and yet it happened. In the middle of this broadcast, uh, there was breaking news about a car accident in the community of Peterview. Uh, yesterday, I'm sorry, this one actually is the fatality from yesterday that we previously reported on. Yesterday on Veterans Highway in Bay Roberts area, there were two trucks racing and passing vehicles on the shoulder of the road. Shocking that people don't think of how bad things can go. Uh, that's a comment that we're now getting from Tracy Moore. Uh, we appreciate the people who took time to be part of this discussion. That's going to continue for another half an hour. But right now, I'll send it over to Debbie. Thanks very much, Zach. And joining me now, the president of Safety NL, Len Lurish. Thank you very much for being here. What do you think of the comments that are coming in? Sound familiar? Uh, very much so. Uh, I want to thank you, Debbie, for this opportunity. Uh, we've been in operation since uh, 1956. So uh, if you can imagine, uh, as the Newfoundland Safety Council, the uh, the different stories and uh, the di different uh, the the amount of information that we've received over that period of time uh, uh, it certainly uh, uh, it drives us in a direction uh, to um, hopefully and I think we're all here pretty much for the same reason is to uh, to reduce those numbers and uh, fatalities and injuries because there's just too many. Mm. Certainly are too many. And one of the focuses of Safety NL is on education. What are you doing 
uh, on that front? Well, we have, uh, there's, a, there's a number of opportunities. We have three different key program areas. One is um, um, traffic safety. The other is occupational health and safety. And the third is community safety. So there's overlap in, in, in all of those. And, and driving has a part to play uh, in just about every category that, uh, that we're involved in. So uh, we focus on uh, working with uh, the younger generation um, with regard to education. Now, I understand, uh, Len, that you were recently in, uh, I believe it was Ron Colley, for uh, a, a talk about safety, and a couple of our students uh, joining us tonight were there. Uh, what, what is your focus getting into the schools? Well, the, the, uh, uh, the initiative that you're talking about is the National uh, Teen Safe Driving Week that occurs each year. Uh, in October, uh, and we've chosen, well, we work closely with Parachute Canada, if anybody's listening, take a look at their website, uh, and the uh, Newfoundland Labrador Injury Prevention Coalition. Um, the focus at, at uh, the National Teen Safe Driving Week is, uh, is basically uh, on teens and driving, and um, it's on safety. And we went to uh, Ron Colley. Uh, it's um, the initiative uh, was started uh, with Parachute, sponsored by uh, Valet. So, um, you were telling me um, earlier that you're trying to um, strike up some sorts of relationships with student council groups. What are you hoping there? Well, we'd like to have uh, ambassadors around the province uh, to help us. Um, get our message into the school and into the community because we think uh, working with kids obviously um, and young adults obviously they uh, they can take the message home mm -hmm. and to their friends and so on. Just on a final point uh, we've been talking a lot tonight about car and truck uh, crashes. Motorcycles also share our roads. What are your thoughts on uh, distracted or aggressive driving in, uh, on motorcycles? Well, we have some very serious concerns uh, when you look at the, um, the statistics and the number of incidents that uh, we observe. Uh, and our, our, we, we have a motorcycle safety program uh, that runs for uh, two and a half days, pretty much. And um, we're concerned about that area as well. In fact, if you put some wheels on it, um, we're going to have th something to say about it. Yeah. Len LaRouche, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Debbie, for this opportunity. You're welcome. And uh, it's over to John once again. Thanks very much, Debbie. Uh, some interesting points from Len LaRouche talking about education, of course, and I'm here with two members of the RNC. And, of course, both police forces in this province have done a lot of educational work around this issue. Uh, Superintendent Joe Boland, first of all, what are the solutions you know, how do you approach this? Well, certainly tonight is part of the solution. It's making people aware. Uh, you know, we do a lot of work in the schools. You know, we, we bring in our, dis, our uh, uh, not distracted driving, but our simulator that we use in high schools. Paul, Sergeant Didham here, I mean, he works with municipalities. We go in and meet with all the municipalities in our jurisdiction. We find out what their concerns are. We work with them to whether it's, you know, looking at signage, looking at the uh, road speeds, uh, we take that information, we come back. Uh, we're always looking down the road, so we have a new initiative. We're not ready to announce it tonight, but an initiative that hopefully will allow us to put more officers on the road to deal with traffic and also be able to collect the data from that information that we receive back and be able to use that data more, uh, more accurately to be able to, uh, you know, it better help us, I guess, to direct our resources to dealing with these issues. Often the criticism is that there aren't enough officers on the highways and that would act as a deterrent. Um, is that the solution? I think as, I, th I certainly think it's part of the solution. I think enforcement is a big part of this. I know the awareness and education is huge as well. Uh, and that's why we're going after this initiative to see if we can't make that a reality. Uh, but the reality in policing in our jurisdiction now is that we have many stresses on policing and our, our, our resources are being stretched in many different directions. But we certainly have our eye on the ball with this. Uh, highway safety has been a number one issue in our corporate plan for the last you know, four years. And it'll be the number one going forward in the next three to four years. Thanks, uh, Superintendent Boland. And, and Paul Didham, Sergeant Paul Didham, I think the last time we bumped into each other, you were perhaps holding a radar gun uh, up on the Outer Ring Road. Um, what are the, I guess, what are some of the practical solutions? 
Well, I mean, when we look at any uh, doing any type of strategic enforcement, uh, we have to look at uh, statistics that uh, really feed us information so that we can properly put our people in place to do strategic enforcement initiatives. We look at awareness and education as well, but I mean, uh, it is unfortunate that uh, enforcement has become our biggest deterrent. Uh, we realize that the public does understand, uh, you know, awareness and education, but but they really understand enforcement. So, you know, when we look at things, uh, certainly we are limited by our resources, which uh, everybody understands. But uh, you know, we look at really if if we want to look at it to, on a smaller picture, if we look at the four of our biggest contributing factors to collisions in within the country, those being impaired driving, distracted driving, uh, speed and aggressive driving, and non-compliance with seatbelts. If the police and the general public focus on those four there, then we're going to see improvements. If we improve our habits as we deal with those four topics, we're going to see improvements and things are going to be safer. You know, and a lot of times, you know, when we're doing initiatives, we, f we try to focus on those four because they are our biggest problems. Now, we have other things that we're working, working on as well that Superintendent Boland uh, mentioned uh, throughout the year, like when we, when we get complaints from uh, the general public or from municipalities. We'll do smaller projects and, and things that are specific to those areas. But generally, we try to focus on the, the big four because we know that those four are going to make a difference. Do you ever feel like you're beating your head against the wall? No, uh, I don't. I mean, uh, it's frustrating and it's sad when we, we have to come out and, and, and we're here. You know, when I hear the stories that are going here tonight, uh, that's frustrating. You know, when I see the faces and, and the, uh, the, what's left of the tragedies uh, that these people have gone through. Yeah, this is the human cost right here. Thanks very much for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you, Joe Boland. Thanks, John. All right, Zach, uh, what have you got? Well, Thanks, uh, guys. Jonathan, uh, the uh, members of the RNC you were just speaking, we've talked about how enforcement sometimes, and unfortunately, often is uh, one of the biggest tools they have to combat a distracted and dangerous driving. Uh, well, as part of this series, uh, we tagged along with the RNC on what they would call an enforcement action. I think most people would just call it a sting. Mm -hmm. uh, we went out to a busy intersection in St. John's. We set up in an unmarked police vehicle, and uh, Sergeant Paul Didham there uh, was the spotter Every single time the light turned red, well, we could just look around on the intersection and he could spot somebody using his cell phone or not wearing a seatbelt. Do you yeah. remember that story? No shortage of material. No shortage. In no. fact, the most surprising thing for me was how many people, uh, Sergeant did have pointed out, who actually got away because all of the officers involved in this action were already busy writing tickets to other people. Right. Uh, but in any case, there was a particular moment uh, from that, uh, that uh, story that I just have to bring back on when we talk about uh, just how flippantly some people disregard these laws. Well, I'll let this clip speak for itself. Yeah, so this, this is something else. We've got a police officer pull. Just tell us what's happening here, Paul. Well, basically, we have an officer who's got a violator stopped and just behind her is somebody obviously that's distracted whatever she's doing there and uh, pretty, pretty pretty evident of what, what she's doing uh, you know so right behind her she passed by a police car and stops at a light and now she's most likely using her mobile device Sergeant Didham, uh, that, that was a very interesting mo and eye-opening moment uh, for me. And yeah, I couldn't help but think that you know the things that we were gawking at, I mean, just must be old hat to you by this point. It's certainly not, uh, not a surprise for me to see things like that going on. You know, it's, it's unfortunate that it's going on and it, can, and it continues to go on. Uh, you know, it's an attitude, attitude change that has to happen. You know, people have to uh, learn new attitudes, new driving habits, and you know, that type of activity has to stop. Well, I, I appreciate uh, that you uh, took time to show us and to show the audience, you know, what it's like uh, from your perspective behind the wheel. And I hope people will sort of get the impression now that, you know, when you are out there driving, you never know when Sergeant Paul Didham or, or another police officer is watching how you're behaving. Well, it was great. I mean, uh, having you out and, and, and again, this forum and being able to, to show the general public about some of the things that we're trying to do to try to make things safer. You know, that is our ultimate goal is to make things safer. Uh, we can't do it ourselves. We need buy-in from the general public. We need help from, from uh, institutions like yourself. And I mean, uh, we are seeing some successes, but we got to keep moving, moving forward. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you again for that. And uh, now we'll send uh, it back over to Debbie, who's standing by with Marina White. Thanks very much, Zach, uh, Marina, and her son, Randy White. Um, the officers were talking about potential solutions, what they're, what they're looking at. It is a frustrating situation at times that the message doesn't always get through. But Randy, you have said that one simple thing saved your life. 
Can you tell us what that was in your accident? A uh, seatbelt saved me. A uh, roll. Um, uh, um, uh, one is a uh, uh, I broke my uh, heart. A uh, very lucky, very lucky. Randy, such a simple thing to do, and we've been told it takes about three seconds to do up that belt. Uh, just just a, a lucky, not lucky, a very smart thing that you uh, did. Very lucky. A uh, uh, fan attack. Marina, you are the vice president of the Brain Injury Association. Uh, you've seen this result too personally as to what can happen on the roads. Do you have any thoughts on the solutions as we go forward? Well, I think um, education and uh, awareness is certainly probably the best tools that we have to work with. Um, as we can see here tonight from our first responders, they're all working so hard to get the message out. And you guys with the media, I mean, it, it, it's responsible for drivers out there to pay attention, not only to the little things, but listen to all these people who are affected by an accident. It's not, it's not just me or Randy. I mean, all these people have to pick up the pieces. And they go home at night and they're with their families. And I mean, it's not simple things to get over. They, they live with this for a lifetime. And I think it's very important, you know, to be cognizant of when you get behind the wheel of your car. You know, it's not only your own life, it's, it's the life of everyone out there on the highway. And, um, you know, one wrong move can, you know, ruin people's lives. And Randy, you have something you want to add? Uh, very lucky. Very lucky. Thank you so much, Randy and Marina. Jonathan, let's hand things back to you. Uh, thanks very much, Debbie. And uh, I'm with Janet Austin of the uh, RCMP again. And Janet, I think one of the things that people need to remember is that as Highway Patrol, you guys deal with, I guess, the vast majority of the high-speed chases in this province. Um, we heard Randy talking about seatbelts. How important are they from your perspective? Well, they're crucial. They, uh, they're engineered and designed to save your life. Uh, an object in motion stays in motion. If your vehicle all of a sudden stops, you keep going if you don't wear your seatbelt. No, I don't want you to, you know, I know, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but um, just as a rough guess, how many of those accidents those fatalities involve people not wearing their seatbelts? Um, so for our jurisdiction last year, 41% of our fatalities were caused by non-use of a seatbelt. Um, and as an analyst having to write those reports, it's very uh, disturbing to write a report that says this person didn't have to die. Uh, when the, the damage to the vehicle is such that because they were ejected, it's what caused the, the death rather than the actual damage to the to vehicle itself. A couple of days ago, our Cecil Hare did a little, I guess, quick survey, and it takes about three seconds to put your seatbelt on. It must be incredibly frustrating for you. It's very frustrating. It's very frustrating. And I think until some people um, deal with somebody that they know that has had a crash that perhaps didn't have their seatbelt on, I think sometimes there's just that attitude of, I'm not going very far, or nothing's going to happen to me. And un unfortunately, it can change in an instant. From a human perspective, you're that person who's got to go up that front porch and deliver the bad news. Uh, what's that like? It's, it's horrible. And, and you're, you're watching people fall apart. And you feel horrible, and you didn't even know the person that they are grieving. And you, it's just the, the, watching the grief is, is the worst part. Final thought for folks out there? Drive safe. Take it, take it uh, responsibly. It's, it can change your life in an instant. Thank you very much. All right, Zach, uh, back over to you. 
Thanks a lot, John. And I'm standing by uh, with some of the young people here in our audience. Uh, Kylie and John and I have moved over to talk about what's, uh, we have sort of the centerpiece of our discu discussion tonight, and that is uh, this mangled car. Let me ask you, first of all, I know I've seen this uh, before, oftentimes done at high schools and junior high schools, uh, where one of the police forces will bring a, a vehicle like this and, and set up nearby as a, a real powerful illustration of what can happen out on the road. Um, have you guys ever seen that kind of demonstration before? No, I haven't. Yeah, John. Yeah, I've never. No, it's never. I've never been this close to an accident before. I think. Well, let me ask you then. How does it feel? And I, I'm talking about down in the gut when you see something like this. When you stand in front of a, a vehicle like this. Um, I really, I really see like the devastation that happened to the vehicle, and I just can't imagine what it'd be like to be in that moment where the the car that you're driving is is completely destroyed, and all around you there's destruction. You're caught in the middle of that. That's it's pretty it makes it really real. Like uh, there's a lot of separation, I think, with with uh, what we see in the news, and and uh, like we never really have it happen to us in, until it does. So it's pretty it's pretty interesting to have it right in in the middle of this conversation. So an astute observation, Kylie. Does it sort of affect you in the same way? Yes, yeah, similar to because you never know what it's going to feel like until it happens, and just seeing this makes you numb really in the fact that within seconds that could be you sitting in that car. Let me just ask you finally, since we can't bring this car to set up in every high school and junior high in Newfoundland and Labrador, what are some of the other things that might uh, have that same effect on a young person to give them that same kind of a, a visceral reaction that you just described that will hopefully stick with them when they are the ones behind the wheel? A lot what we're doing now at Stand for Hannah is like younger people are out speaking. Like, yes, when, like, say, RNC or RCMP come and talk into a high school, they're going to listen and pay attention, but they're not really going to see the effect behind it if they would as someone just like them that could be affected by it. John, you agree that that message has to come from within your peer group? Yeah, I really think that when it, uh, when you have the, the situation where it's it's another just another teacher talking to you, just like the regular lesson, like it, where it's an adult, but it becomes so real when it is somebody similar to our age, and that's happened before in our school, and and seeing it coming from that perspective bring makes it all the more real. Guys, it's, it's an important perspective to get out there. Appreciate it very much. All right, we'll send it over to Debbie. Thanks very much, Zach, and I'm back again with uh, Superintendent Don Byrne of the St. John's Regional Fire Department uh, or Services, whichever is the correct title there, Don. Um, one of the things that you wanted to make sure we talk about is safety of the first responders. Talk to me about that. Well, that's a big issue. Um, when the first responders are on scene, in particular on your uh, higher speed roads, your outer ring road, pits, and TCH, you're going to be on the scene of a very, quite often a very traumatic accident. And the drivers who are passing by this, they actually don't slow down. So we've had situations that are very close calls. We've had people who've taken tiger flares, pylons, right underneath the vehicles and just drive on. You've had people drive by with their phone, who are driving, taking pictures really? as they drive by. So it's the safety of the first responders, the firefighters, the police officers, the paramedics, the tow truck drivers, that is at risk at all times at these scenes. And the public needs to pay attention to these lights, to the scenes, and pay attention to getting through these accident scenes without rubbernecking, as we call it, mm -hmm. uh, at the scene, and get that speed down, because we're putting the first responders at risk. One accident is bad enough. One is bad enough, you don't want to impound it. Yeah. Yeah. Superintendent Nonburn, thank you very much. Okay, Jonathan? Deb, well, um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, back with Rudy Singleton of uh, Safety NL, and Rudy, a couple of final thoughts on this. Well, uh, this has been a very uh, moving uh, evening for sure. And uh, the officers, as they spoke about the, the enforcement component, and I know from seeing them on the road that their resources are really taxed heavily. But I think that the supplement to that has to be uh, in the education in the education component. They have to complement the, uh, the enforcement because unless people see that the dangers that are just so prevalent and if people don't get over this air of invincibility, 
and are not educated in things like the move over rule that the, that the fire captain just uh, just alluded to there where you see the emergency vehicles if people don't know the rules well you know they're certainly not going to abide by them so uh, just knowing and that just the dangers of driving and the things that are lurking out there, and if our vigilance is reduced, well, the chances are, are, are exponentially increased. Just as a quick final thought, ever give any thought to perhaps refresher courses uh, for drivers? Oh, yes, and, and we offer them through Safety NL uh, to senior drivers and refresher drivers through service clubs, and, and we just want to get the educational message out there. Well, I hope that we've helped tonight, Rudy. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank CBC for this great initiative. It's just been marvelous the whole great. week. Thank you. And I'm sure we're going to hear from you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Okay, Zach, over to you. Thanks a lot, John. We want to get in just a few more comments uh, from our online audience. We really appreciate everybody who uh, took time to watch us online tonight, and especially those of you who've been writing in with your questions, your comments. I apologize if we can't get to them all. Uh, but the first one I want to bring in comes from a first responder who's watching all the way from Cape Breton. Jeff Boyce says, watching from Cape Breton, I am a former paramedic and feel all of your first responders' comments personally. It is a job nobody can understand, and it always stays with you. Thank you for sharing that, Jeff. And again, thank you to the first responders who've been sharing with us in the way that Jeff just described, how much he appreciates seeing that. All right, I want to get a few more comments from our Facebook audience. Firstly, from Wanda Murphy Barnes. She says, what an amazingly important conversation we all need to hear. The young people speak so eloquently along with Hannah's parents. I agree with that, Wanda. Thank you so much. From Brenda Coombs, very powerful show. I think we should send Heidi and Kylie to every school in Newfoundland and Labrador. Great job, everyone. I'll second that, Brenda. From Elaine Hatcher, well done, CBC. Hopefully, this changes the way some people drive and the choices they make. That's the idea, Elaine. Thank you for your comment. And lastly, from Calvin T. Andrews on Facebook. He says, your program is touching an open wound but doing it sensitively. I'm remembering November 22nd, 1972, when we lost both grandparents to a highway accident. Well, thank you for sharing that, Calvin. And to everybody who wrote in and watched us online, we appreciate it. Now I'll send it back over to Debbie. Okay, thank you very much, Zach. We heard earlier in our program uh, from a relative, the uncle of Alyssa Davis, uh, Corey Kavanaugh spoke with me a couple of days ago, and I just want to let you hear one more comment that he had. And I'm being told that uh, they're not able to put their hands on it, but he had a lot of thoughts on what it's going to take to change people's attitudes. He talked about it's a responsibility if you have a driver's license. He also talked about perhaps increasing the age limit uh, for getting your license. If, if it doesn't get through to some people, maybe that's something to look at. He had some thoughts, and of course he had a lot of emotion, and somebody who who is also very emotionally moved by this subject, Gail Thorne, Hannah Thorne's mother. Uh, once again, Gail, we've heard a lot of things here tonight. What are your overall uh, impressions of this? Again, it starts with education and awareness, and this is definitely uh, an avenue. Um, it also starts with yourself. Everybody has choice. When you get a, in your vehicle, you have that choice. Abide by the rules. It's simple. Hannah's death was preventable. Hannah did not have to die this way. Somebody took that, his vehicle, conscious choice to disobey the rules of the road, and it caused a death. I do not want anybody to go through what we, as a family, as a community, as a mother, I don't want anybody to go through what we are going through. As I said, when I first spoke with you, this is the first time you've spoken publicly. I know how difficult this is, but it's important for you, isn't it? It is important to me. Once again, I don't want anybody to go through this. Hannah's not here to speak about this. I have to be Hannah's voice. Stand for Hannah Foundation has to be her voice, and we have to drive change. And Gail, you have... Something here to remember Hannah by. She's in your heart, but she's here as well. What does it say? It I love you. From 
Robert Munch book, which was all a very special to, to a book to us. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Thank you so much. And uh, I know everybody who's watching is wishing you and your family well. Thank you very much, Gail Thorne. Thank you. Jonathan? Well, I don't know if there's a better way to wrap it up than that. That is it for tonight's special. Thank you for everyone at home for joining us, being part of the conversation. Thanks to everybody in this studio. Thanks to Zach Gowdy for doing such a great job, and my partner, Debbie Cooper. To the frontline emergency workers, thank you for giving us your perspective. We want to wish you a good night, and please, if you're driving, take it easy. Good night, everyone. <laughs>